Welcome to the YB Min Lecture Series offered by the Center for Asian Business at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, California. This program is funded by a grant from the International Communications Foundation in Seoul, Korea. I hope you enjoy the program. Thank you. Um, so I run the Los Angeles World Affairs Council. It's the biggest foreign policy forum in Southern California. And last year we did 72 events, including the conference that um, was mentioned on the future of Asia. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about tonight. Um, you know, Asia, Asia is pretty cool. Asia is huge, particularly in population. And that's, that's sort of the, the, perhaps the single most uh, important fact to remind, remind oneself about Asia. In fact, there's this there was this Swedish statistician, Rolf Hansling, you may have heard of him, who um, coined uh, the concept of the world's PIN code. He said, if you look at the whole world, the world's PIN code is 1114. And what he meant by that, I'll decode that, there are 1 billion people, approximately, who live in the Americas, 1 billion people who live in Europe, the Middle East, 1 billion, approximately, in Africa, and 4 billion in Asia. He said, if you, if you project out until just 2050, the world's PIN code will be 1125. One billion in the Americas, one billion in Europe, two billion in Africa, five billion in Asia. And it's important to remember that because everything else uh, that, that happens in Asia flows from this enormous uh, population. You've got two countries with over a billion people. Um, that has not only environmental consequences, but also has consequences in the, on the commercial side. So if you're beta testing something uh, in a small little province like Uttar Pradesh in India, you already have 200 million people uh, just in one province. Um, so your data is going to be a lot more reliable than uh, beta testing in a, in a you know, suburb of San Francisco. And I think it, it's, it's sometimes hard for, for us in the United States to get our minds around what the size of Asia really means. Um, when, we, when we think of... Uh, what, what Asia means for us, we think of a threat. Uh, Trump, and we're talking tonight a bit about Trump, uh, Trump started out uh, from a posture that he didn't want to really uh, get involved too much in Asia. He saw China as a threat. Uh, he felt that our alliances with our Asian allies were a waste of time, um, and he was going to sort of pull up the fences, engage in a trade war with China, impose 45% tariffs on Chinese goods, and that was it. Um, now, that was then, as he was campaigning, and I think his views have somewhat tempered since then, and that's going to be what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, the, uh, the sort of initial sense that we got from, from, from the people that were around Trump was that this was going to be a very competitive relationship. He, he sort of, um, he, you, know, you may have heard of Peter Navarro, uh, who was put in, in the USTR. Uh, talked about death by China. Um, clearly, Steve Bannon um, has uh, got this worldview that China is our next enemy and that everything we can do to contain China is, is, is worth doing, including being friendly with Putin. And that was their sort of play. We befriend Russia as opposed to what Nixon did with Kissinger, isolate Russia by befriending China. Um, I think that that, that came to a, to a pretty quick halt. Um, first, uh, we had two visits by the Japanese Prime Minister, um, Abe, this is Abe meeting Modi, but we had Abe come to visit uh, after Trump was elected, before he even was inaugurated. Um, he presented Trump with a $3,800 gold inlaid uh, driver for golf. And this was part of the Japanese strategy. And he, he basically delivered a message that he wanted to be a friend and that he could help a, uh, US contain China. And this resonated with Trump. Uh, he was then invited back and had their famous weekend in, in Mar-a-Lago. Um, then uh, the Chinese got involved, and uh, they very carefully followed Abe's footsteps. The access to Trump came through Jared Kushner, his son-in-law, um, and the Chinese ambassador in, in Washington, Sui Tian Kai, did exactly the same. He went and knocked on Jared Kushner's door and said, we need to talk. And so they sort of started to talk, talk Trump down from this position, which 
which they were very uncomfortable with being, being put up as, as, the, as the major bogey, bogeyman, um, talked through the notion of, of what, the, what the threat would be from, from a trade war. Um, and I think that they were also able to, to sort of find some daylight within the administration between those who were arguing for full-on confrontation with China and those who were slightly more, more sensible. So you, you, you had this sort of emerging uh, uh, shift within the Trump administration um, from its sort of campaign rhetoric to now we have to govern and what are we going to do now? Um, I think that probably one of the things that, that was important to, when you, when you look at the, the, the trade numbers, global trade is going down, I think there was a concern um, that this was not a good time to start a trade war. Uh, Trump knew why he got elected. Uh, people were concerned about jobs. And I think that the argument was made to him that if you start a trade war, that'll just get worse, not better. So you, see, you sort of saw this shift um, starting to, to sort of take place in the administration. We'll come back to that a bit later, but let me, let me get, get back to what I wanted to talk about uh, first to set the stage. So I think in the end of the day, uh, the future of Asia, it's going to be all about China. Uh, pretty much everything uh, that is going on in Asia is somehow impacted by China. Uh, its economy, the, the population-wise, is about the same as India, 1.2, 1.3 billion. Uh, but China's economy is five times the size of India's, and India's going to have to work really, really hard to, to catch up. Um, so China has also got this uh, increasingly outward uh, uh, motion, um, uh, what can I say, assertion of its, of its power. Uh, India doesn't have that instinct, really. Um, the Chinese are not only flexing their military muscles in the South China Sea, um, but also uh, trying to project power across Central Asia with this concept of the uh, new Silk Road, the one belt, one road concept. Um, and that is affecting pretty much every country in Asia. Um, as a, a Singaporean uh, speaker at our conference last year said, you know, we in Singapore, Singapore is a tiny little five million people, tip of Southeast Asia. We in Singapore, we want to have a relationship with the United States. We want to have a relationship with China. We don't want to have to choose between the two. And that's where Asia is starting to head now, that China is becoming a polarizing force. And you're seeing in Southeast Asia, countries are having to choose who do we ally ourselves with, the Chinese or the United States. And that's very uncomfortable for a lot of Asians. Um, so uh, you've got this, this big behemoth. Um, it has a big wall, the, the Great Wall of China was uh, eminently successful in keeping out every single Mexican who tried to get in, um, which President Trump, I'm sure, was very impressed with, um, and has basically got disputes with a whole bunch of its neighbors. And very relevantly, and we'll come back to this later, China is very lonely in Asia. It has no allies. The United States has 68 military alliances around the world. China has zero. Um, and that's quite relevant for, for something that we'll talk about later. Um, this is Asia by night. This is quite interesting. Um, these are real lights. Um, people love to look at North Korea here. There's South Korea, full of lights. That's Japan there. North Korea is that big dark space. They don't have much power in North Korea. Not doing very well. Uh, like kind of the Himalayas, where no lights there. But North Korea is a country, no lights. Um, Asia is one of the most interconnected societies, electronically and technologically, in the world. So back in, only in 2005, I think it was 14% of Asians had mobile middle class, uh, mo sorry, mobile, mobile internet access. Uh, by 2014, it was 89%. The increase is just extraordinary. And in many cases, both in India and in China, they've sort of uh, leaped over the sort of landline process that we went through in the United States. Everyone went from no phone to smartphone. Um, and that is, that is sort of quite substantially changed the, the way uh, Asians do business. Um, I was in China just last week after Japan. Um, Chinese don't use credit cards really at all. They pay for everything with WeChat by their smartphone. And WeChat is sort of a messaging service, but you have a WeChat money account. And if you go to dinner in a Chinese restaurant and just say it's a 500 renminbi, um, if there are four people, somebody will pay for it out of the WeChat account. And then the other three will give the balance, 125 renminbi each, uh, just by two or three taps on the phone to the person who's paid the bill. And they all walk out, and nothing else has happened. Um, they find it very odd that Americans still use credit cards. They find it very inefficient and highly open to fraud. 
Um, so in that sense, Asia has really leapfrogged uh, some of our technology in the United States. Um, but in other senses, um, it's still a country that's learning. India, for example, uh, for all its uh, techno-friendly uh, uh, smartphones, India still struggles with a 30% illiteracy rate, uh, which is going to be a problem later on as they try and grow their economy uh, fast enough to keep up with their population. China, by contrast, has 96% literacy. Um, so let's go back to Abe and Modi. This is where some of the problems start to, start to set in. The uh, Japanese and the Indians, I'm sorry, are increasingly concerned about the growth of China, particularly uh, its military advances in the South China Sea. Not so much because they have any concern about those islands per se, but because world trade, a lot of it goes through that part of the world. Um, and they see uh, the Chinese building their military installations on those reefs and islands, the great concern. And so now, uh, these two men have become best friends, um, visit regularly. Uh, the Japanese are now exporting weapons to the Indians. First time they've done this since the Second World War anywhere. Um, that did not come without a green light from the Pentagon. Um, and so you can see the beginnings of a strategy to contain China, which everyone says we're not doing. But you've got the Indians and the Japanese doing joint military naval exercises in the South China Sea. Um, you've got the US with its uh, military allies in Southeast Asia, the Thais, the Singaporeans, uh, the Australians are down off the end of the map here. The Filipinos are still um, hosting US troops, much as the president likes to rail against the United States in public. There's still a very functional uh, military alliance between the Philippines and the US. And so effectively, if you look at this, if you imagine yourself sitting in Beijing, you're seeing South Korea and Japan, who are both military alliance, both have military alliance in the United States. You're seeing the uh, Southeast Asians, you're seeing the Australians, you're seeing the Indians, and you're looking at an encirclement. And that's how the Chinese see it. Um, and that is starting to raise tensions uh, between China and the United States. The Chinese, for that reason, have been building out their uh, properties that they, they have this famous nine dot line that goes all the way down here. And they've been fulfilling out reefs all through the South China Sea, uh, fortifying them, putting on runways and anti-aircraft missile systems um, with the quite clear aim to force the US out of what they call the first island chain to try and get them out into the Pacific. Ultimately, the Chinese want them all completely out of the West Pacific. Um, so far, the US hasn't really um, given into that. And we still sail our aircraft carriers through the South China Sea <clears throat> and overfly it with our, with our planes. But the tension is increasing. And as you probably know, uh, these close flybys can get increasingly threatening as, as, they, as they come closer and closer. Now, let's move on from the encirclement to the befriending of Xi Jinping. Um, as you know, uh, we had a, a summit in Mar-a-Lago between the Chinese Premier, or President, uh, Xi Jinping, and President Trump last Thursday and Friday. Um, the message before they went in was quite threatening. Uh, Trump took to his tweet, tweeting several days before and talked about how hard the meetings are going to be and how tough he's going to push China. It didn't quite work out like that uh, because we had the uh, chemical bombing, chemical attacks in Syria, and then the US decided 62 hours later, and I stress 62 hours later, uh, to bomb Syria as Trump and Xi Jinping were sitting down to eat lobster and steak. Um, I submit that that was not a coincidence in timing. I think if Trump were meeting Abe for dinner in Mar-a-Lago, they would have delayed the bombing or done it before. But I think this was time to send a very strong message to Xi Jinping. Um, and it completely overshadowed all the talks they had about trade in the summit. So the Chinese got a very strong message that Trump, one, is crazy as a dog, and two, he's prepared to bomb when he gets upset about something. Um, that was not their assessment of Obama, whom they regarded as timid and unwilling to confront them in the South China Sea. Now, that may or may not be valid from a US perspective, but this is how the Chinese see it. Um, and they were very uh, upset about this, this upstaging of the summit. Uh, the Chinese are, you know, they're, they're quite careful in how they 
express their discontent. So uh, as long as President Xi was in the United States, the uh, Chinese press dutifully said, yes, it's a wonderful summit and pity about the bombing, but life goes on. As soon as Xi got back to China, the press did a 180 degree turn and started saying this is awful. Trump is crazy as a dog and he's bombing people and uh, it was a dishonor to, to our president to have to listen to this, so on and so forth. Um, the Chinese were quite nervous by this. It was, it was a real reality check for them. Um, I, uh, I, uh, I can't speak with any degree of certainty, but I, I think it's highly unlikely that this was uh, a coincidental timing. Not that they knew that the Syrian chemical attacks were going to happen, but the response, I think, was, was timed uh, for the Chinese presence. And it's all about this, this country. Um, now, if anyone in this world is crazy as a dog, it's these guys here, the North Koreans. Um, and their current leader, Kim Jong-un. So this is a leader, the third in a dynasty, um, who has done everything he can to make himself the world's most dangerous person. Um, this is a man who has seen people starve in his country so that they can put uh, nuclear materials into the tips of these missiles. Um, they have, they're the only country in the world that has carried out a nuclear test in the 21st century, the only one. Nobody else has tested in the 21st century, and they've done five. Um, they are now working on a long-range missile, an inter intercontinental ballistic missile, um, that they intend to uh, have the ability to hit the United States. And I can tell you this is not going down well in the Pentagon and in PACOM. PACOM is our Pacific Command out in Hawaii. Um, you might have seen in the newspapers on Saturday, uh, PACOM just dispatched the USS Vinson, which is one of our aircraft carriers, to the seas just off the east coast of Korea. Um, this is another part of this strategy, along with the bombing of, of, uh, in Syria, to persuade the North Koreans that we are serious about confronting them on their nuclear program. Now, the perception uh, in the Trump administration uh, is that, and this has been said openly by the Secretary of State, Rex Tillerson, that the North Koreans sort of got a free pass under the Obama administration. Um, all, this attempt, all these attempts to negotiate failed, and now we have to take the gloves off, so, so to speak. And so I think that the, uh, uh, the Trump administration is sort of putting itself in a position where it will back, it will try and back China into a corner uh, and basically make the point, if you don't help us <clears throat> to defang North Korea, we'll do it on our own. And Trump has said as much in his tweets. Um, now that is very threatening, and I don't have to tell you that the downside to any military assault in North Korea is substantial, even if it does not go nuclear. And I actually su suspect it would not go nuclear, because I think that's the North Koreans, as extreme as they are, they don't want to commit suicide, and it would be quite clear if they were to use one nuke, we would use 100, and it would be the end of North Korea. And so I don't think it would go nuclear, but it doesn't have to go nuclear to be extremely damaging. So North Korea has thousands of artillery pieces uh, built into hills, looking well, directed right at Seoul. Seoul is just 30 miles from, from the DMZ, from the demilitarized zone, so it's, it's, it's not, a, not a, a long distance to shoot. And they could probably kill, you know, they, they talk about turning Seoul into a sea of fire. They could probably kill 130,000 Koreans in the first two hours of bombardment before their artillery pieces started to malfunction or we started hitting them from the air. Uh, that's sort of the best estimate that I've seen in, in sort of independent um, uh, think tanks. That is nasty, very nasty. Um, lots of innocent people would die. Uh, there are American troops who are based in Seoul. And so the, the idea of a uh, clinical strike on, on North Korea is highly problematic. But I think that it is now a, a possibility that has to be taken very seriously um, because I think the president has indicated that he is not going to put up with a North Korea uh, that has a nuclear capacity and is developing a missile that could hit Los Angeles. Um, so that's, this, is, this, is a, this is a very serious uh, and probably the, the single most serious foreign policy challenge that, that the uh, next four years, the administration next four years will face. Uh, I think that uh, the, certainly people in Seoul are very anxious about this. Uh, the Chinese don't like to be backed into a corner. They don't want to be the ones that have to uh, tell a communist regime that your time is up. 
Um, they are nervous about seeing the collapse of the North Korean regime, which would uh, probably lead to, to Seoul, the South Korean government moving north with its American allies. And then you have American troops on the Yellow River, which is what the whole Korean War was fought about back in the 1950, early 1950s. And um, so the Chinese are very uncomfortable with this, and they don't know what to do, frankly. And so they're, up to now, what they've done is they've kept punting um, trying to kick the can down the road. But I, I think that it's reaching a critical point now. The, the, the fact that North Korea has nuclear weapons, we've known that for quite some time. But you combine a nuclear weapon with a missile that can hit the United States, and it takes it to another level. And I think an American president who is told by his, the commander of his Joint Chiefs that the North Koreans are about to test a, uh, a missile that could hit the United States uh, would be inclined to take action. Um, and that, I think, was the message that was delivered to the Chinese in their dinnertime surprise in Mar-a-Lago. Um, trade. Trade is important. Uh, the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership that uh, 11 nations had tried to work out, uh, has been rebuffed by President Trump. Um, I don't think that they're going to revive it, but I think we might see TPP in another form, because I think that as this battle goes on, which we talked about before, between the sort of the, the America first a click in the White House and the more internationally minded advisors, um, people are going to realize that actually trade is a good thing. And trading uh, and having, having an American uh, sort of framework for trading with all our legal protections is an even better thing, particularly if we're trying to combat all those abuses which we have complained about and which the Trump administration has complained about uh, that China visits on us in terms of lack of reciprocity and, and market access. So I, I suspect that they will actually make some progress on trade. You know, at Mar-a-Lago, this wasn't really covered very, very broadly by the media because the, the bombing in Syria over, overshadowed it. But Mar-a-Lago, they were talking nitty-gritty stuff like, when will China allow US beef to be imported? And how can China buy US technology? And what can we do with you know, various little uh, trading uh, sort of sectoral issues? And I think that's the way they'll go forward. Uh, nobody's talking anymore about a 45% tariff on Chinese goods, which uh, would have been calamitous for both sides, I think. You just get into a trade war and everyone loses. Um, there, there, are clearly, there are clearly some, some, some needs for, for uh, the Chinese to, to open up a bit. Uh, I think that they can negotiate on that. They know they've had a free ride for quite a while. Uh, you know, since, since China uh, really started to open up after, after Tiananmen Square, um, 1990, uh, when Deng Xiaoping did his famous trip down to the south and, and said, you know, getting rich is okay, socialism with capitalist characteristics. In those days, just at that time, 1990, Chinese per capita GDP was only $340 per person per year. It's now tipping $8,000. So that's in 25, 27 years. The growth in China's economy has been extraordinary, and it's been on the back of one, a US guaranteed free and open and fair trading system uh, between Asia and the United States, and two, access to America's enormous market. Uh, China has benefited enormously from its relationship with, China, with, with the United States and wants to continue. And uh, we have a half a trillion dollar tra trade, trading relationship every year. Uh, that's immensely, up to, up to now, is immensely in China's favor. Uh, we export roughly 150 billion goods to China, billion dollars of goods a year to China, they import to the United States 350, 360 billion. So, so it's vastly in their favor. They want, to, they want to see that continue. So I think being very pragmatic, the Chinese will do a deal on trade and make Trump uh, able to say, I got this and that from China um, and go home happy. Um, I, don't, I don't think either side wants a trade war. Um, it, 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 it also begs the question of, of what China, and in fact other countries in Asia, what they will do to, to reform their own economies. Um, and all the major economies in Asia have some serious issues. So China, for starters, uh, its economy is now shrinking, well not shrinking, but the, the rate of growth is going down. Uh, shrinking is the wrong word. China's economy grew last year probably 6.5%. Uh, it may hit 6% this year, and um, they're really trying to goose the figures, but they're, they're, they're struggling to keep up those enormously uh, steep 
uh, growth rates that they had since 2000, where they were growing most years by 10%, 10 or 9, 9 or 10 percent. That's not going to keep happening. And of course, that's very critical in China because the whole deal with China is you keep making people rich, they won't demand uh, political rights. And, and they're sort of running out of the, uh, the, uh, the fuel to, to, to prime the pump. Um, they may well face some political opposition. And that's sort of a big unknown. I don't really want to get into that tonight because we could talk about that for years. But you know, what happens, China's political risk is enormous and it will only continue to increase. And that I think makes Xi Jinping a very insecure man, which may explain some of his behavior. But so China needs to change its model, uh, depending on foreign investment um, and uh, uh, factories that then manufacture goods to export to the United States is not going to get them uh, back to their growth rates. They need to both increase domestic consumption and also, very important for the Chinese, uh, to uh, get rid of some of their state-owned enterprises, which are a, a really a, a drag on their entire economy. Um, there are 90 eight Chinese companies on the Fortune 500 list. Um, of that 98, 76 are state-owned. So only 22 of those companies are private in China. Um, and those state-owned companies, they're huge. They're huge because they're run by the Chinese government, but they're very inefficient. And most damagingly to private companies in China, they absorb all the uh, capital from the banks. So it's very hard if you're private company in China to actually get loans from banks because m most of it goes straight to the uh, state owned enterprises. And of course, the banks are all owned by the state, so it's kind of a, a fixed system. But it's not just China that has problems with its economy. Um, the Japanese economy has flatlined for the last 25 years. I lived in Japan in the early 90s. A bowl of ramen noodles in Tokyo cost 700 yen. I was in Japan last week. A bowl of ramen noodles costs 700 yen. This is 25 years where they've gone nowhere. And this is not that China, the Japanese don't have any money. In fact, their corporations are very cash rich. They've got huge amounts of money, but they don't know what to invest it in. They're very risk averse. They completely missed the internet and the digital revolution. They didn't know what to do with that. You know, the last great product out of Japan arguably was the Sony Walkman, and where is that today? Um, but they've missed everything that came since then. Um, the big new thing in Japan now is AI. It was interesting. I was, uh, I was at a meeting of uh, one of their big uh, management associations, um, and I was talking to some of their leaders. And they were saying, yes, you know, Japan, we have this problem with our population because it's going down, um, but we can win with AI. In other words, we can write computer programs to make stuff with robots, and then we don't need any workers at all. Um, and it's funny, because after I went down into the subway, and there was a bookstore. Uh, in the subway, and there on the shelves of the bookstore, the main bestsellers, there were about 20 books, all of them about AI. So, you know, Japan tends to move together, and so clearly Japanese business authors are all writing the same book, which is about how AI will, will save Japan. Remains to be seen if that will be the savior of Japan, but at the moment, Japan is just going nowhere, um, barely cracking out, cranking out 1% growth a year. Um, it's sort of a, a, an elegantly managed decline. Uh, there is a reverse problem in India, uh, which last year grew faster than China. Uh, India, I mentioned, has a very high uh, rate of illiteracy. Um, and this is a problem. India will never take over as a manufacturing hub, will never rival China. It just doesn't have the infrastructure, and it's too late, frankly. And um, the Chinese are basically corner of that market. And those <coughs> new factories that are being set up are all going to East Asia on the periphery of China, so Indonesia. Vietnam, Bangladesh. Um, India is never going to be making our tennis shoes and our plastic buckets and everything you buy in Walmart. Um, what India can do is um, make a lot of money in IT and technology. Uh, one, most Indians who, uh, who at least been to school uh, speak English. And they have that kind of a mind. They're, 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 the, the Indian mind seems to be well adapted to mathematics. Um, and so, so they, they produce, you know, 85% of the H1B visas go to Indians. Um, this, is, this is a strong suit for them. However, that only works if you've got a good education and you can read and write. If you have 30% of your population who can't read and write, it's unclear what role they will play in the 21st century. And this is a great failing of India. Their other big problem is that they still haven't managed to really loosen the grip of their bureaucrats and all the red tape that they impose on the Indian economy. So trying to open a business in India, it is a nightmare. 
uh, trying to get a lease on a building, trying to get a loan, trying to set up. Uh, it's, it's, it's extremely time consuming. Um, Prime Minister Modi, whose picture we saw shaking the hands of Abe, has tried hard. But India is, it's like moving, moving one of those air, aircraft, control, aircraft uh, carriers. It takes a long, long time. Um, and a lot of companies have been to India and got frustrated and, and, and left. So that's, that's a challenge that India has. It's sort of the opposite to, to sort of hyper, hyper uh, rich Japan. And then Korea um, has a similar issue with its chaebol. Uh, not clear that the, these sort of enormous conglomerates um, are, are the uh, sort of the most convenient way to, to run an economy. And we've seen the problems recently with Samsung who were playing a good game, taking, taking Apple to, its, uh, to task with, with their, their Samsung phones, um, making some incredible mistakes um, with a phone that blew up. Uh, how could that happen? And it, it, as, as they've started to investigate this, it's been basically bad management. Um, it should never have happened, but the loss to, the, to, to Samsung has been extraordinary. And I think that overall, the, the Korean economy is, is sort of hamstrung by these very large conglomerates that don't really have any business sense, but are controlled by very, very powerful uh, men who don't want to give up power over their, their conglomerates. Um, well, just a little word about um, the, the downside of, of all this economic growth in Asia. Um, the pollution is legendary. Uh, it's, it was somewhat interesting to see President Xi Jinping in Davos this year talking about China taking the lead on uh, solving the climate change issues uh, in the world, given that China is the single largest producer of greenhouse gases. Um, yes, they produce lots of solar panels, but they need them because they're choking. Um, one of the uh, interesting facts that this is Tiananmen Square, you can barely see it. This is Tiananmen Square in, in Beijing. Um, China is being rapidly joined by India. In some cases, India's overtaken China. 17 of the 20 most polluted cities in the world are actually in India, not in China. Um, but it is a huge problem, and the, it is a fact, as the, as the Chinese and the Indians will, will say, well, you Americans and you Europeans, you had your awful pollution when you went through the Industrial Revolution, so you, know, you need to allow us to do the same. Well, fair enough, but the damage that is being done by a modern economy with you know, a million new cars a day uh, is far more uh, substantial than what was being done by a few uh, you know, smokestacks in, in, in central London uh, 100 years ago. Um, this may be irreversible, and the damage will not be just done to Asia, the damage will be done to, to, the, to the entire world. But Asia is, this is a huge problem in Asia. And it's got to be such a problem, it's one of the few issues actually, interestingly, in China that people can complain about. So generally in China, if you start complaining about anything that uh, encroaches upon government territory, they'll, they'll shut you down uh, you know, on, on, the, the, uh, on the web. Um, environmental issues are fair game because the Chinese understand that this is something that affects everyone. And, and we've seen, of course, a lot of Chinese trying to leave the country because they're, they're tired of all the pollution. Um, aging population is another issue that the uh, uh, Asians are going to face serially. Japan, of course, is the most famous. Um, the, uh, by 2050, I know that in, I get these figures right because they're quite extraordinary. Um, by 2050, 40% of Japanese will be retirees, 40%. Uh, doesn't look good for, for uh, supporting their, their welfare and their health system. Um, adult diapers already outsell baby diapers in Japan. Um, Japanese just not having babies. Um, China has a similar issue. By 2050, China will have 699 million people working, but 348 million people um, in retirement. So that's a two to one ratio. Um, it's, just, it's just getting worse and worse, and no one wants to have a baby. Uh, in China, the going rate this is interesting. To, uh, for those people who want to have uh, um, uh, sperm donations, the going rate for a sperm donation in China is now 5,000 B, which is about 800 US dollars. If you do the math on that, as a percentage of, of uh, uh, per capita GDP, it means equivalent of about $5,000 for an American, um, which shows you how, how valuable it is to create a baby. Um, and still, they're not creating enough babies. 
So uh, this, is a, this is going to be a longer term break on Asian growth. Um, and I bring it up because one of the issues that Asia faces is, a, is a, a resistance to immigration. So for example, there are many, many Filipinos and Thais and Indonesians who would love to work in Japan um, and do the buildings and you know, paint, the, paint, the, paint the buildings, um, do the car parks, whatever. Um, the Japanese are uncomfortable with that, won't let them in. And so Japan is continuing on its demographic decline. By 2050, they'll have lost. They'll go from 127 million today to 100, 100 million Japanese. There's a date. Somebody computed a date, 3,457, 3, I think, when the last, Chinese, last Japanese person lives, um, if they don't change their current birth rates. Um, so finally, um, the military option. This is probably, and I'm just repri reprising what I was saying about North Korea, this is probably the biggest unknown about the future of Asia. There are a series of, of very uh, contentious, uh, uh, what shall I say, territorial disputes, starting with, we talked about the South China Sea, um, the Senkaku, as the Japanese call them, the Senkaku Islands, the Jiaoyu Islands, as the Chinese call them, in the East China Sea. Um, you have the, the issue with, with um, uh, North Korea. And then you've got you know, various smaller conflicts festering around the region. Uh, Asia is not a happy place uh, militarily. Uh, the arms business loves it. So our uh, defense contractors are making huge uh, sales throughout Asia. Everyone wants to buy submarines, even secondary nations. So the Vietnamese, the Thais, uh, all buying submarines, uh, which further ramp, ramps up the, the threat. It's, uh, I think the, the, the fundamental showdown is between China and the rest. And the United States, and this is a US aircraft carrier, uh, will play the crucial role here. Um, and that is why so many of the countries in Asia are very anxious if they see any sign that the US is starting to, to withdraw because they see the US as, a, as a, a neutral policeman and are very concerned that if the US were to pull back, for starters, the Japanese would probably want to go nuclear because they would feel they needed their own nuclear umbrella. Uh, that is not a good message to the rest of Asia. Um, South Koreans might even go nuclear if they felt that North Korea was threatening them and the Americans wouldn't help them. Uh, you will see uh, the Chinese trying to assert themselves uh, in a way that might not be would be prejudicial to freedom of navigation and, and fair trade. So a lot of anxiety should the US pull back. And I think that the initial signals from the Trump uh, campaign uh, sent uh, a lot of anxiety throughout Asia. People are starting to, to think that maybe it's not going to be as bad as they, as they feared. But that was certainly a big issue as, as the campaign started. So just to summarize, uh, I think the, the main game now in Asia is parsing the Trump administration. Who's going to win out, the internationalizers or the nationalists? The camp that seems to be forming around President's son-in-law, Jared Kushner, um, and the, uh, certainly the Secretary of Defense, Jim Mattis, and the National Security Advisor, McMaster, or the camp around Steve Bannon, uh, Peter Navarro and these economic nationalists, America firsters, who, who really want to turn their back on the rest of the world. And so that's what's happening in, 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 in DC right now. I don't have the answer to how that's going to play out. Um, a lot of the appointments haven't yet been made. So for example, uh, Rex Tillerson, the uh, Secretary of State, doesn't have a deputy, uh, nor does he have an Assistant Secretary for Asia. They just haven't been appointed yet. And the names that they put forward so far have been nixed. Uh, by the White House, principally by, by Steve Bannon. Um, the same with the Defense Department. There is no head of Asia in the Defense Department yet. So this is still a policy that's in the making. But I've tried to give you a sense of, of what I think are the important issues. Um, we will be discussing these at our conference uh, in September. And I suspect that the future of Asia will be as future of Asia stroke the US, at least for this, this year. I think that's what we're going to be talking about a lot. Um, but I'll leave it there. Um, welcome your questions. Uh, it's sort of a, a, an open question as to where this is all going, but all I can say is it's very, very important, whatever does happen. Thank you. There are two parts to that question. One is, 
their technical capability to do it. The second is their political readiness to try it. Um, what we're concerned about now is that they are upgrading their technical capability. They're getting close to an ability to do it. Um, and who knows, the best intelligence that I've seen is that sometime in the next three or four years, they will have developed an intercontinental ballistic missile which can go all the way up out into the atmosphere, come back down and hit California. Um, they've recently talked about testing a, a solid state uh, rocket booster that could do this. Um, I don't know how long it'll take them to do it. And we, we continually are trying to disrupt that, just like we did with Iran. You know, we send in malware and try and mess, mess around with their targeting and so on. Um, but at least that's, they're, they're heading towards that. I personally don't think the North Koreans would ever use a nuclear weapon against the United States because they would never have anything close to our arsenal. And President Clinton said back in 1996, if the North Koreans were to ever use a nuclear weapon, it would be the end of their country as they know it. So a minute after they have launched, they would be annihilated. So I don't think they would use it. It's more the destabilizing effect that it has on the region, uh, kind of like why we don't want Iran to have a nuclear weapon, because then Saudi would get it and Egypt would probably get it. So it's sort of the same calculation. Um, plus, the North Koreans are, are extremely, uh, what's the word? Uh, they have almost no hesitation in uh, undermining the system, that, because they're not part of the world system. So if it means you know, bringing down Sony, if it means stealing uh, you know, uh, uh, money from, from the Central Bank of Bangladesh, if it means exporting opium, they do it all. They don't care. Um, and so I think that, that that sort of mad dog approach of Kim Jong-un makes people very concerned. And as a military, and I understand as a military planner, you, you just don't want to have this guy with a nuclear weapon and a missile that can reach the United States. I, I think the real, so the, the, the problems of pollution in China don't fundamentally come from China's manufacturing plants. They come from their power generators. And it comes from China's reliance on coal. And actually, India has the same problem. So yes, the reason why pollution is going up in China is because of this increase in manufacturing. But it's not that you know a Nike factory in China is pushing out all this pollution, it's that the power generating plants that give the Nike factory lights and power to operate are all using burning coal. And that's not going to change because the Chinese don't have anything close to the amount of enough oil that they need, and nor do they want to you know, spend billions of dollars a year importing oil, and they already do, but, but they don't want to add to that uh, when they have their own, their own coal. Um, and coal is, is pretty cheap and pretty, pretty easy for them to, to mine. Um, getting them to change that, that's going to be a huge huge lift. They're, um, as they pledge to increase the uh, percentage of renewable energy in their economy, and they are doing that, but as the economy grows, it doesn't really matter if they keep building new coal power plants, which they're doing. Even as it goes from, sort of, say, 2% of the economy to 5% of the economy that's renewable, the amount, the absolute amount of, 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 of coal generating power is also still increasing. And so it's not getting better, it's getting worse. Um, and you see that, you know, a lot of the, uh, the Chinese uh, um, uh, families that set up here in, in, in California, uh, the reason they're coming, I mean, they're wealthy, the reason they're coming is they want their kids out of these horrible cities. Uh, it's almost, I was in, 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 in Shanghai last week, it's almost impossible, uh, particularly in Beijing, for a foreign company to bring a new <clears throat> worker from overseas to live in Beijing if he or she has kids, because people just don't want to go there anymore. It's, it's so unhealthy. And so that's, that's, that's a really big problem. And, and you know, a lot of Chinese companies, as you say, kind of get the message. They need to be more sustainable. And uh, I was at Alibaba in Hangzhou uh, uh, last week. You know, they, they pr proudly show visitors all these solar panels they have on the side of the factories. But uh, you look out across the street, and, and you can see these, these chimneys and just pumping out smoke into the air. So it's, it's, it's an issue, really, of power supply more than anything else in China. The real threat as China's neighbors perceive it in the South China Sea is not that they are going to take over you know, one of the large islands of the Philippines or a strip of Vietnam. It's that controlling those, those mostly artificial islands, a lot of these were, were barely 
you know, reefs barely above the water and the Chinese dumped enormous amounts of sand on them and built them up. It's that they, they will use those to, to control access to shipping that goes through the South China Sea. And that's a very busy shipping. That's something like half of all the world's trade goes through the South China Sea. Uh, and so if China were able to collect toll effectively uh, on half the world's trade, that would be a major problem. Or if we were able to stop it, that would be a major problem. Um, so that's the real concern. There, there are other issues. There is supposedly a substantial amount of, of oil and gas underneath uh, the South China Sea. Um, there are various estimates. Uh, a little bit of drilling has been done. No one really knows how much is there. And then there are also disputes over fishing. These are sort of minor. The real issue is access um, and were the Chinese to stamp down. Because if you look at South, uh, the South China Sea, well, ships come from, from, the, uh, from the Gulf or, or wherever. Um, and they, they go through the Straits of Malacca here. And then anything that goes up to the east coast of China, Japan, Korea, has to go through. If it doesn't go, go through the South China Sea, you've got to go all the way around Indonesia and come up through Lombok or somewhere and come up this way. It's a much longer journey. Um, and so this is very strategic. Um, the, the, uh, the Asian neighbors uh, are very uncomfortable with China effectively uh, putting itself in a position of being able to control their trade. It's like you know, having, a, having a, a grasp of their bank account. They, they, they don't like that. So that's what it's really about. The US um, gets that. The, militarily, the US doesn't feel that threatened. And US, if you ask US military commanders about these islands, they say they're undefendable. You know, we could take them out in 20 minutes uh, because they're, you know, they're, just, they're, they're barely above the, the water level. They'd be very easy to hit with various assets that we have. So it's not so much a military threat. It's more what they could do to deny commercial shipping access. Yes, yeah, so the currency manipulation is a good one. Um, it's, it's pretty um, clear that the Chinese were doing their best to keep their currency uh, down um, about 10, 12 years ago, and it helped them a lot in terms of exporting. However, in the last two or three years, the Chinese central bank has actually been doing the opposite. They've been trying to keep the renminbi up um, because they do not want to see more currency fleeing their country. Um, in 2015, they lost about a trillion dollars. That's a lot. China's foreign reserves are four trillion, they're now three trillion. And the trillion that's missing is mostly here and in Western Australia, and you know, it's bought property and so on and so forth. And so the claim that was made on the campaign trail that China's a currency manipulator has, you probably know, has been pretty quickly dropped once they got into power. And somebody from the Treasury went over and said, Excuse me, Mr. President, it's actually the other way around. Um, doesn't mean that China wouldn't revert to that in the future, but it doesn't, it, it's certainly not uh, applicable now. And China's main concern is, is trying to keep its, keep its uh, foreign reserves in, in country and not lose everything. <laughs> you know, they, they sort of reach a, a pain level. Um, and so that I don't think, and from all the readouts I saw of the, of the summit with, with Xi, uh, that wasn't really even brought up. They just didn't go there. The Chinese indeed have been pouring a lot of money, particularly into Africa, uh, mostly for selfish reasons. Uh, you know, the Chinese are not building roads in Africa so that Africans can drive their cars. They're building roads so that Chinese trucks can take copper and zinc from mines in the interior to the ports where they can then bring them back to China. But nonetheless, it has a, an enhancing effect to, to these countries and, and helps them. And, and you know, they, they, uh, they've clearly found some resonance with uh, particularly countries that we won't even touch. So Chinese have been deeply involved, for example, in Sudan. And of course, we, we don't touch Sudan because of, Sudan because of the Darfur uh, genocide. Um, but th that has been quite strategic. And, and similarly, in, in, in South America, the Chinese have been quite active. Some of their bets haven't really paid off. So the Chinese, as you probably know, uh, lent a lot of money to Venezuela. That hasn't gone too well for them. Um, but uh, overall, I think the Chinese have, have made uh, advances in Africa, and they want to make far larger advances uh, in this sort of Central Asian uh, sort of corridor. The idea is that they will open up a corridor all across Central Asia into, into Europe. And that's the one belt, one road strategy. Um, now, of course, their major uh, opponent there will not be us, but the Russians, who don't like to see the Chinese moving into their backyard. Uh, the Russians don't have the money. Uh, the Chinese have plenty of money, and you know their Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank has been capitalized at 100 billion, I think, um, and they're throwing money around uh, mostly on Chinese products. So they will go to Kazakhstan and they'll say, you know what, you need a new whatever it might be, highway or 
uh, whatever, big stadium. And by the way, we have the, the steel and the cement to build it for you, and we'll have, we're bringing these Chinese companies. So it's, it's, it's a slightly um, self-interested policy, but it certainly leaves stuff on the ground that is useful and is seen to be Chinese, and the US is nowhere to be seen. The, I, I, I think that, I mentioned this earlier, I think this is one of the most, probably the critical question about the future of China, uh, and nobody has a good answer to it. Uh, or you've got 88 million members of the Communist Party in China. Um, it's uh, been riven with corruption. Uh, you've seen a very active anti-corruption crackdown by President Xi. Uh, since he came to power, because I think, in this case, I think he analyzed correctly that the Communist Party was at risk of losing all credibility in the country. Um, a lot of the people that have uh, built houses in, in Pasadena and San Marino here are party officials who clearly got their money through corrupt uh, practices. Very unpopular throughout China. The government has been able to uh, keep its control over its population, one, as I mentioned, by increasing economic uh, 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 payoffs to people, uh, and two, by an increasingly draconian control of the media and the internet. So you probably know that Google is banned in China. Um, this is the world's second biggest economy that wants to be a major player in technological uh, innovation in the 21st century, and yet they feel they have to ban Google. Um, I leave it up to you to work out is that a sign of stability or not. Um, we don't see any sort of in, insurgent political opposition in China at the moment. The penalties for that are extreme. Um, this is a country that put its Nobel Peace Prize winner, Liu Xiaobo, into jail uh, for daring to challenge the government. Um, so the, the, um, the, the sort of the penalties are very harsh. And so far, we haven't seen, you know, since 1989, um, when we had Tiananmen Square, nothing really has coalesced in China. But I, my personal sense is that this is not stable. Uh, when I see Xi Jinping asserting Chinese power in the region, I see a rooster push, puffing, puffing himself up and trying to make himself look bigger than he is. I think, I think they are extremely nervous about their stability. Uh, you know, the, the Chinese government spends more on its internal security than on its external security. So their police force and their various uh, intelligence apparatuses in domestic China focused on their own people, get more money than their army and their navy and their air force. Uh, about two million Chinese are employed in checking the internet for you know, social messaging and internet postings. Uh, this is not a sign of stability and confidence. Um, I don't know how long they can keep this going. Uh, my personal sense is that this will not work for them in the long term. Um, but that's, to me, that's the great, the great question that hangs over China for the future of political risk. And I don't know if anyone can really answer that, but it is a concern. There are some people that say the Chinese are complicit to some degree with North Korea's nuclear tests. I personally don't think that's the case. I think it really irritates the Chinese that the North Koreans let off these nuclear tests. Um, however, it is clearly the case that North Korea could not have even got to stage one of this without some level of Chinese uh, um, acquiescence. So for example, um, a lot of the uh, materials that they use to build their nuclear program are imported either directly from China or from third countries that come through China. Pretty much everything comes through China. Um, I don't believe the Chinese intelligence services are so amateur they don't know what's in those cargo ships that are going into, into North Korea. Um, similarly, um, I think the Chinese know a lot more about the inner workings of the North Korean government than they let on. But I don't know that they have much control. I don't think the North Koreans want to listen to the Chinese. And I think that the only power the Chinese really have is sort of a, 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 an analog of, of, of what we did with Iran, which is effectively imposing sanctions, which means effectively stopping imports of Chinese, particularly fuel and fertilizer and so on, to North Korea, uh, basically shutting the country down. Um, 
And I think the reason why the Chinese don't want to do that is that they see that precipitating a collapse of North Korea, and then you get the South Koreans involved and the Americans, and that's kind of China's bigger nightmare. Um, but I don't think China is very happy with North Korea. I think they wish that they would just go away uh, with this nuclear thing. Um, but they're not prepared to take the steps to stop it. And that brings us to the scenario we talked about where uh, unilateral involvement by the United States could, could get ugly very, very quickly. Thank you.